Alpha universe. And as you will see, the solutions, uh, they, the, the ones that we have today, they are pretty radical. Radical in a sense of giving up on sacred principles, such as either Lorentzian variance or locality or things like that. Uh, not that we are happy by doing that, but that's where we are after more than 50 years of trying on that big cosmological constant problem. Uh, another, uh, another aspect of it is, of course, you can uh, look and accept the multiverse picture in which there are huge number of vacua and we live only in the one in which, which can sustain our life. That's another option for it. And I will go through some of these uh, considerations for you. So uh, the current view of the universe, this accepted view of the universe, is that uh, the laws of nature that we know of are encoded in general relativity, that's the theory of gravity, uh, and also in the standard model of particle physics, uh, that's a field theory which is based on principles of quantum mechanics and you know, relativistic, th relativistic principles. Uh, so they encode all the laws that we uh, seem to need uh, for description of the nature. Uh, and also there is a content on the universe which is placed uh, precisely within those theories to understand what the universe does. Uh, in the contents, we know for sure there is matter, and matter here refers to ordinary stuff that uh, we are made of. Uh, actually, most of it just, you know, two quarks up and down, and photons and electrons and, and gluons, and maybe there is a third quark somewhere. Uh, but, uh, you know, and, 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 and then there is also radiation and neutrinos. I separated neutrinos for, for uh, multiple reasons, but let, let me uh, put it there just like that. Uh, and then there is things that we don't understand well, and that's dark matter. So dark matter is not part of the standard model of particle physics, but uh, we know that it has to be there. And then there is dark energy. Uh, this is something that I just mentioned. Uh, again, this was discovered in wonderful works, uh, actually, as I was finishing my graduate studies. Uh, and it was a revolutionary discovery. I, I know you heard uh, some very interesting talks here by the discoverers themselves. Uh, and there is, there is a lot still going on about uh, dark energy in terms of making more precise, what's the value, uh, and so on and so forth, what does it imply. But that won't be part of my talk. The reason why that won't be part of my talk is that the old cosmological constant is so huge as compared to the scale of dark energy, which is shown here, that you can actually neglect this. Of course, it's a separate issue how to explain this. But in the zeros approximation, actually, I'll be ignoring this, this number. And I'll be talking about the number which is actually 60 orders of magnitude bigger than this. Uh, so, but before I get there, uh, and if you don't ask questions that I'm about to ask, this is extremely successful parameterization of nature. So you just write the equations, put in those numbers, and that describes the universe at an amazing precision. And of course, we are very happy about that. It's a problem of our understanding when, when, you, when you go a little bit beyond of parametrization. And that's what this talk is about. So the rest of the talk will be organized as follows. I'll tell you what that, or remind you rather, what that uh, old CC stands for the cosmological constant problem is. And then I will very briefly summarize the early attempts and early means here, the ones before 1987. And uh, the reason 1987, because in that year, Steven Weinberg proved a no-go theorem that no, no matter how clever those constructions, there is a universal principle why they won't work. Uh, and that's a very important benchmark because uh, you can then start from there and try to understand what can work. Uh, then, obviously, uh, we can talk about uh, symmetries uh, to await uh, this no-go theorem. And there is one example, uh, and this is speaking of something dramatic or radical. That's an example which gives up on Lorentz invariance, which is a uh, you know, fundamental feature of uh, the micro world. Uh, we see no violation of Lorentz invariance in uh, fundamental interactions, even though you know, we all violate Lorentz invariance fundamentally, it's there and no violation has been detected, and yet this, uh, this is a proposal in which it might be violated certain scales, but hidden, and, and this is what helps to solve the problem. 
I will also discuss uh, another loophole in the no-go theorem uh, and what successes and uh, failures it leads to. And finally, another uh, dramatic departure for conventional thinking is non-local theories. Uh, and that's all we have for today to solve that problem. So let me, let me begin uh, summarizing what the problem is. As you know, in quantum mechanics, there are zero point fluctuations for any particle that uh, obeys the laws of quantum mechanics. Uh, and then you have scales for those zero point fluctuations and those fluctuations are physical, measurable in various circumstances and various instances. Uh, and uh, they all contribute to what's called vacuum energy. Casimir energy, for instance, is one example of that you may be familiar with, but there are many other manifestations throughout the particle physics, uh, well, theories as well as experiments. Um, and uh, the problem is that we have different scales. There is a scale of electromagnetism. There is a scale of strong interactions. There is a scale of weak interactions. They differ from each other significantly, and they might be scales of some other new interactions beyond that. And all of them contribute to the vacuum energy. Contribute proportionally to the size, to, to you know, their scale to some power fourth. Uh, and it's very hard to understand why the universe wouldn't have that much vacuum and energy in it. And it doesn't. So, uh, Pauli, uh, there, is, I, I, uh, there is a reference, but I wasn't able to find the reference, and if you ask me, I will find, but there is a reference in which Pauli already noticed that, uh, and uh, he said, well, it's obvious that vacuum energy doesn't gravitate, because it was so clear that it's there, based on quantum mechanics, and then it was so clear that it, it, it doesn't affect our world somehow. So it's either canceled by something, and then it's not there, or it is there, and somehow doesn't have the same gravitational properties that everything else has. So his comment was that it doesn't gravitate. Well, it's easy to say that, but it's very difficult to actually have a theory which would do that because general relativity is uh, invariant theory which couples universally to all sorts of matter and energy. And cosmological counter vacuum energy is not no different in that respect. But first uh, published work in which some calculation was done uh, at, the, at the level of you know, Feynman diagrams and the, the loops and things like this was by Zeldovich, 1967. He agreed to eliminate the one loop, uh, this is a little bit technical, the, the, the leading contribution to the cosmological energy, leading quantum contribution to, to the cosmological constant, which would be zero point uh, energies. He said, let's cancel it and let's see what will be induced after that. So he calculated loop corrections to it. And that loop correction was already huge, even if he only knew, knew physics at one GV scale. So back then, he was thinking of protons and neutrons, didn't quite know about quarks, didn't quite uh, think about Ws and Zs and weak interactions and all that, which also contribute to the same thing. But already protons and neutrons, uh, the theory of protons and neutrons interacting through pions and rows, that already gives you uh, a, a huge contribution to the vacuum energy as compared to the observed. And the observed is the one that I showed you on the last slide. It was 10 to the minus 3. Uh, so the observed, uh, actually it was two slides before. That's the observed one, order of magnitude. So it's 10 to the minus 29 grams per centimeter cubed. So if you assume, well, if you also consider weak interactions and then assume that nothing else contribute above, or, uh, then you get 60 orders of magnitude difference approximately between the observed and what you would naturally get. Uh, so how about Pauli's idea that uh, could it be that really this is somehow special and it doesn't gravitate? Well, uh, locally, locally, that vacuum energy we know does gravitate. One example of it is uh, the, what's called the quark condensate, right? In, in theory of strong interactions, in QCD, uh, right, I, I shouldn't be using this jargon uh, for undergraduates. There's a theory of strong interactions that describes quarks and gluons, which make, uh, you know, protons and neutrons and uh, all, all the other hadrons. Uh, and in that theory, uh, there is a non-zero expectation value of anti-quark and quark, 
because of strong uh, gluonic field fluctuations. And that expectation value, A, contributes to the masses of the hadrons. For instance, the proton mass is significantly influenced by the value of that non-zero condensate. And B, also contributes to the cosmological constant. So, well, we know for sure the protons gravitate pretty well and neutrons gravitate pretty well. So this idea that all of a sudden uh, the vacuum energy for some reason you know, doesn't gravitate, at least in that naive formulation, doesn't quite work. If, it's, if it has some life, it has to be more subtle. So we will see that. On the other hand, uh, you say, uh, what's the problem with the, with the picture that I outlined? So I just told you that you parameterize everything just like this, and then we're happy. We observe the universe. We, we describe the universe that we observe. So what we do when we accept this picture is we do a tremendous fine tuning. So we do fine tuning of uh, you know, one part in uh, 10 to the 60. So uh, we, we, we reduce that, that, that constant to some small number. We postulate that that number is just that, and we go with it. Now, uh, in some other cases, we also do that. For instance, you can say, oh, electron mass is 0.5 MeV. And that's a small number as compared to you know, high energy scale, the Planck mass. Why don't I call that fine tuning as well? And why don't I worry about that as well? The reason why is because electron, electron mass, when you write down field theory and look at the quantum loop renormalization, does not receive divergent contributions from high energy physics. It's a, it's a nature of the theory that you have written based on symmetries that that, that theory has. Uh, the cosmological constant is not like that. You write a number, and then there are quadratic renormalizations, quadratic additive renormalizations, which are sensitive to very high energy physics. So the natural value that the theory tells you it should have is at the higher end of your uh, high energy physics, whatever it is, unless there is a pro some protection from some symmetries. So that's a big difference. It's not to say that we don't want to understand where the electron mass is coming from. In the final theory, of course, we'd like to understand that too. But it's a different problem. So in, for the cosmological constant, we cannot even stick in and, and be happy with it because it receives huge renormalizations. So that's, that's a big difference. Um, so we'd like to get rid of that fine tuning or understand uh, you know, what, what replaces it. Uh, so there is no other parameter in that picture of the universe that I outlined, which is like that, except the Higgs. Uh, Higgs mass. And you, you would know that there is a whole industry of trying to understand what's called the beyond the standard model physics, precisely motivated by the fact that the Higgs mass is sensitive to ultraviolet, quadratically sensitive to ultraviolet physics. You have some wonderful uh, colleagues here working in that direction, and that's very important. But this is very similar, but for cosmological constant. Now, a little bit more precise, and you know, I know they say that once you write the equation, you lose half of the audience, but I hope I don't, especially here, and I'll try to explain. Uh, I'm not gonna go beyond a basic GR and uh, basic quantum mechanics, so, and also try to explain. So what's written here is the Einstein equation. If you have not seen it, uh, it's time to learn. This is for <laughs> undergraduate students. Uh, the left-hand side, don't be scared with all these indices. The left-hand side encodes curvatures, uh, space-time curvatures, it's not only spatial curvatures, it's space-time curvatures, which arise in response to uh, energy and matter that you put on the right-hand side. Very roughly, you can think that way. Now, the right-hand side, I've separated in two parts. Don't be scared by, you know, 8 pi or G Newton. This is Newton's constant, by the way. And this encodes uh, energy and momentum of all kinds of stuff. It says DM stands for dark matter, and then I cannot see what it says, but it's, oh, it's M. It's uh, matter, and then radiation, uh, and so on. And then it has a separate piece, and that's the cosmological constant. So cosmological constant is synonymous to vacuum energy that I was talking to, uh, about. So there is a multiplication between the two. If I take vacuum energy and multiply by 8 pi g newton, that's the cosmological constant, okay? So I will be using interchangeably vacuum energy and cosmological constant, so that's what it is. Now you would ask, how do I separate this from this stuff? Is it arbitrary? I mean, I can reshuffle things back and forth. But in fact, it's not arbitrary in the context in which I'm asking this question, 
if I have a universe, let's say starting in uh, Big Bang or whatnot, we don't know exactly what it was, but it's some earlier stages and is evolving in, a, in one vacuum state. That's a universe I would like to understand. Then all this stuff that you have here dilutes away with the expansion, right? So you know if you put non-relativistic matter, it will, its density will dilute as the volume. So you increase the volume and then density dilutes, obviously. The same for the radiation. Uh, but this one does not. It stays a constant. And that's a very special property of the cosmological constant because it has negative pressure as well. So negative pressure, which equals in magnitude to the density, work together in, in a way that the de energy density remains constant. It's very unusual, but you can do little thermodynamics uh, with negative pressure equals to plus density, and you will get that, uh, in fact. So that's how you separate this out. You think of infinite future in some sense, assuming that, of course, you are staying in that vacuum state in which things are evolving. And in that future, only this remains. Everything else dilutes. So it's a, that separation is unique. And the problem is that this, that number receives contributions for all sorts of, all sorts of physics. Electromagnetism, atomic electromagnetism is you know, strong, weak, everything. And if you, if you trust those numbers, it should be huge. But it's not huge, it's 10 to the minus 3 to the fourth divided time times Newton's constant, which gives you this number, 10 to the minus 33 electron volt square. That's inverse of the radius curvature of the present day universe. Okay, so it's, uh, the, the radius curvature will be something like 10 to the 28 centimeters. That's the size of the observable universe approximately, right? So that's what, that's what this number is. And uh, if you trusted that, that, that physics, uh, pre previous one, the, the high energy physics and contributions from all, all sorts of uh, quanta, then you would have gotten a number which would make the universe really, really small, tiny, non nothing, like, nothing like we observe. So the goal is uh, to deal with this big lambda, come up with a mechanism that, well, ideally reduces it to this number, but that's very difficult. I don't know how to do that. Uh, that's why the approach here is that to reduce it to zero, because zero is somewhat special, maybe that, that could be easier, and you will, see, you will see, even that is very difficult. But to reduce it to zero, and then the observed value of dark energy, for that we do have some scenario, in fact, uh, to get it through more quantum mechanically better formulated substances than the cosmological constant. Okay, so that's the, that's the philosophy that I will be pursuing. So dark energy will be due to something. Uh, it could be a quintessence field in which, which, which has, you know, well-motivated quantum uh, description. It's not it, it's stable with respect to those, those loop corrections. Uh, or it could be some modifications of uh, gravity by massive gravity, which again are kind of technically, what's called technically natural. But this big contribution, the vacuum energy, we, we want to nullify. Well, as I said, uh, we're not first. People, before discovering dark energy, obviously, they wanted to nullify that too. Uh, and uh, there are remarkable works. If you go back and read them, they are extremely clever constructions as to um, how people attempted to do that. Some of the authors are listed here. They are very distinguished physicists. So the idea is that you start with that number, big number, and then you postulate the existence of new fields here it's only one scalar field. This is a potential of that scalar field. And that potential has a dynamics, and dynamics is organized in such a way that it precisely cancels the value of this dynamically, so you get zero. Now, this, this was very much motivated by another problem that existed in particle physics. Uh, it, it was called the strong CP problem. It's, 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 it's a problem as to why we don't see violation of CP uh, symmetry in a strong interaction, nuclear force, uh, and uh, so that one, one proposed solution for that is what's called the axion, and you know, over the lunch with Gigi we were just talking about axions and things like this. So people were motivated by the axion mechanism, because that mechanism precisely, it works precisely like that. There is a number there, which is called some theta parameter, and you want it to be zero or very close to zero, and the axion potential is being introduced, and axion then has such d dynamics that it adjusts its value so that it cancels that theta. And uh, also some of the people are actually authors of the axions, and Frank Wilczek is the one who actually introduced the axion. 
So, so that was thinking, perhaps for the cosmological constant, you can also have that kind of adjustment, dynamical adjustment mechanism. Uh, and these works all tried that in various versions. None of that worked, as I said in the introduction, until there was a no-go theorem proven that there is a basic reason why none of them work, no matter how clever. You know, this, this, this looks like in the Middle Ages, people were trying to come up with perpetuum mobile, right? So there's something that works for eternity. Uh, of course, none of that works because they violate energy conservation. But if you don't know that there is a law of conservation of energy, you try and come up with extremely smart constructions. And if you look at all, all those you know, old uh, Middle Age constructions, uh, they're they are amazing. And it's very hard to uh, find in many of those cases as to where it, it goes wrong, where, it, where, where exactly it's not going to work. But you know it's not going to work because there is conservation of energy. So some, some, some people still are making proposals. And you know, you get, so once in a while, you get papers to referee along those lines. And it's very, they're very clever constructions, very hard to find where they go wrong. Uh, but it, eventually, there is some where we go wrong, because there is a universal, actually, theorem that tells you uh, why, why these things are happening. And you know, these days, I kind of more like every single time I refer, no matter how clever construction, I say, how about Weinberg's theorem? How you await it? Because that's a principle. It's like conservation of energy in some sense, right? So, so, so statement here would be that in the conventional field theory with conventional general relativity, uh, in, when you want to preserve fundamental principles such as Poincare invariance, you cannot have the adjustment mechanism without tremendous fine tunings that we are doing anyways. And therefore, the unconventional approaches are, are, are needed. So, well, Weinberg himself proposed something which is very unconventional to me. He proposed the anthropic. Well, he didn't propose the anthropic when some other people did before him, but he put it on more scientific ground, uh, did some, some, some nice calculations in that paper that if you have uh, multiplicity of vacua with different values of vacuum energy, and then uh, probabilistically and uh, then anthropically, you would, you would, of course, anthropically prefer, well, well you, you could only live in the one in which the, the value of the vacuum energy is rather small uh, so that it, it lets uh, galaxies to form and you know, the curvature is not that high. Uh, and then there is a whole reincarnation of that approach within the context of string theory. That by itself is a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, but I will not have much to say about that topic because the problem that I would like to understand is whether we can solve the cosmological kind of problem in one vacuum. And by itself, that's a valid question to ask. If we prove that you cannot, that by itself will be a very strong indication that you have to have this multiplicity of vacuum and that's the way how nature works. But uh, li like in mathematics, we want to go by you know, statements. So if in vacuum vacuum can we solve or we cannot? And how, what, what, what it costs to solve in one vacuum. So that's what I'll be addressing. And to do that, let me, uh, let me give you extremely uh, over, actually oversimplified version of uh, the theorem, uh, the Nogo theorem. Uh, it, it, it's based on a very simple fact. So what's written here is, a, is an equation of motion of that scalar field. So let's say you want to adjust, you want to use this adjustment mechanism I spoke about, and you have this scalar field. And this is just the equation of motion of that scalar. So this is just a harmonic oscillator with some potential. And this is a friction term uh, because of the cosmological expansion. That's all it, who, it, who it is. So it's, it's just, uh, uh, actually, it's also Newton's second law with a friction. So here is your acceleration, here is your friction, and here is your force. So it's, it's no, no different from that. But what, what you want to uh, have is that the value of the total potential, that po total potential has in it now vacuum energy as well, that you want to be zero or very, very nearly zero because if it's not zero, it gives rise to the curvature. And you know, we don't see that curvature. That's, that's a condition. And you also want the derivatives to be zero because you want to do this with constant fields uh, because the time-dependent fields or space-dependent fields, they would violate Poincare invariant. I'm, I, I'm speaking of Poincare invariant. So it's Lorentz invariance plus spatial translation plus time translation. That's Poincare invariance, right? So we don't want to violate that because fundamentally we don't see a violation of that in our universe, and therefore that was a condition. But then you see that you always have, even if you did n different scalar fields like this, you will always have n plus 1 equation for n unknowns, and which tells you that you cannot satisfy that without fine tunings. Uh, in essence, that's what it boils down, but it's more complex, of course, the whole proof. 
with all kinds of possible loopholes also covered. But uh, the reason why you, you may say, oh, but, but we know that if we lived in a supersymmetric world, for instance, then uh, you know, it would be guaranteed to be, to be zero, the vacuum energy. Well, that's because there's, in some cases, there are symmetries which, which guarantee that this is zero automatically. So then there is no extra condition because of the you know, requirement of the potential at the minimum be zero. And you know, supersymmetry is one example like this, or scale invariance another, is another example like this. But uh, the problem is that we don't live in worlds which are either nearly supersymmetric or nearly scale invariance, invariant. Nearly means that you have to be, that scale has to be close to this 10 to the minus three. So you would have to have supersymmetry at the scale of 10 to the minus three electron volts. And if supersymmetry exists, hopefully it does, it is somewhere about you know, 10 TV or something like that, I don't know. Uh, but uh, so, so it, it doesn't, doesn't help you. Scale invariance, the same story. But we will see that, I will present in the next slide, a, a proposal which uses other highly unusual and unconventional symmetries which try to do the same as what supersymmetry would have done in terms of the cosmological constant. So I'll give you three examples, either other symmetry or maybe you can look into the loophole of this theorem, which is related to the fact that the fields uh, does, don't necessarily have to be constant. Uh, or you can evade the conditions of the theorem by, by mar giving up on some important fundamental concept, such as locality, in fact. So I'll give you those examples. And again, uh, this is to say that those examples are call for some dramatic changes in our understanding. And uh, I'm not sure whether those are uh, results of lack of our imagination, lack of work, but it's been a while since people thought about this uh, problem and probably some new ideas are, are needed and very welcome and I'm very glad to hear, see, see here young people. So, okay, here is one uh, symmetry-based idea by uh, Raman Sandram and uh, David E. Kaplan. Uh, they introduced a concept of energy parity. So H stands for the Hamiltonian. This is very basic uh, thing, quantum mechanics. So H stands for a Hamiltonian of whatever your theory have, and P is a, this, this energy parity operator, and it anti-commutes with the Hamiltonian. And if so, then any energy eigenstate, this is an energy eigenstate of this Hamiltonian with positive energy, its parity partner will have negative energy. That's a consequence of this. So that means that for every electron, you have, uh, it's called ghost electron, which has negative energy, okay? So this not to be confused with particles and antiparticles. For those who know quantum field theory and have just taken T of T1, if you take just ordinary stuff, we quant you, you have you know, positive energy solutions and negative energy solutions, and we quantize positive energy solutions moving forward in time, and negative energy solutions we qu quantize going backward in time just to say that they are just antiparticles. But physically, they have positive energy. A positron has positive mass, right? So this is different from it. So this is somebody who will have negative mass. And same for every single standard model particle. So that's, that's the proposal. So it's, it's a very courageous proposal. I mean, it's, it, this is a compliment to the authors. I mean, when you have some, some idea like that, how to navigate the field of all sorts of constraints that, that emerge, it's, not, it's really difficult, and uh, they seem to be, they, they, they did it. So then you would ask, so gravity is, not, gravity is not included at this point. So this symmetry applies to the non-gravitational stuff and an exact symmetry for non-gravitational part. And well, so far, no problem because uh, the two sectors are disjoint from each other. They just don't interact. You have the all normal stuff, and then you have this ghost sector. They don't interact. That's all, that's all fine. Uh, and if so, then uh, this symmetry guarantees that vacuum energy is zero because one sector gives you positive contribution, another sector gives you negative contribution. So simple example here is you can think of this as a photon or a gluon, uh, and this, this will be the parity partner of, of it. Uh, and as you see, their actions have opposite signs uh, by, by, by that requirement, and they would give rise to the vacuum energies which have opposite signs, and they will just cancel because those are just constants. So that symmetry guarantees it. However, 
of you, you want it to interact with gravity, of course, because you know we have interaction with gravity. And the moment you switch on gravity, gravity is you know universally couples to uh, all of that stuff. So the gravity loops themselves; they won't be protected from uh, the symmetry arguments, and they will generate, uh, they will break that degeneracy. They will generate some non-zero value of the uh, vacuum energy. But that's actually uh, a good news because if the cutoff of that gravity is rather low, something like 10 to the minus 3 EV to the fourth, uh, then you get the, you know, the value that you observe in the universe for the vacuum energy. Uh, the difficulty here, of course, this is always nice, but the difficulty here is, of course, is that the, this other sector, the Gauss sector, makes our universe very unstable. For instance, uh, some partner particle in the other sector has negative mass and negative energy, so that means that out of a vacuum, there is a non-zero probability to pop out normal particle and the Gauss particle that will conserve energy as well as, a mom as momentum. Let's say they are back to back, momentum is conserved because of that, and then one has negative energy and another has positive energy, total energy is also zero. So energy and momentum are conserved, and yet that amplitude has non-zero probability, and you can calculate that, and that means that there is a tremendous instability of the vacuum in that kind of theory. Uh, however, you can work out all those details and all those uh, production rates and so on and so forth. And what you will find out is that for a certain cutoff, which is actually a little bit uh, bigger than this, it's, it's okay. Those instabilities are really, really slow. They won't give rise to anything dramatic at the time scale of our universe. For instance, you may, wor you may be worried that you know, I, can, I can produce all sorts of Backgrounds, for instance, some, some background of photons which would compete with CMB, uh, but if you put that cutoff then, and calculate as to how much you produce, that will be subdominant to everything that we observe in our universe. And that's what they postulated. So it's a very low uh, cutoff of the theory. So, so then what are the problems? Problems are that uh, we don't know what the theory is after that cutoff. And even though in gravitational physics, we didn't quite measure distances shorter than inverse of that scale, in accelerator physics, for sure, the, our colleagues measured high energy experiment, uh, high energy processes uh, at, at scales much bigger than 10 to the three electron volts. And in those processes, there is no sign of any weirdness of gravity, right? So or gravitational corrections are negligible, they're not taking into account, they're, they're not important. So no matter what change, it has to be as weak as ordinary GR or weaker. Uh, and it's, it, and it's, it's not clear how to complete those theories about that, that cutoff. Um, plus, um, plus the, the cutoff itself has to violate Lorentz invariance. Otherwise, you, you won't be able to tame those instabilities that I talked about, that's a necessary condition in this context. Uh, and whole construction of having uh, ultraviolet physics be, be, beyond that scale is, is uh, somewhat difficult to imagine. I mean, string theory is one example in which classical general relativity gets completed into high energy behavior. And it's a very clever mechanism by introducing huge number of uh, higher spin states and uh, in, a, in a special way. Uh, here, you cannot hope for anything like this for two reasons. First of all, that scale is very, very low. That means that you would, you would find those new states at very low energy scales. And because of the multiplicity, even though if, if they are very weakly coupled, because of the multiplicity, you would observe some consequences of that in the accelerated experiment or, or in other, any, uh, other experiments. Uh, but also, it has to be explicitly Lorentz violating. So the only thing I can think of, there are these interesting proposals by Peter Hojala at Berkeley uh, who proposed alternatives to UV completion of gravity, which are explicitly Lorentz breaking. But in, this, in his case, he's thinking of the high scale of Lorentz breaking. Perhaps those theories you can exactly apply for this. Actually, it will be a, an interesting exercise if this hasn't been done for a uh, graduate student to do exercise like this. And then you will see what the consequences are, are when you have really a theory that takes you above that scale and you can do calculations and make predictions for uh, all sorts of processes. He, 
here in this context because uh, those, those ghosts that I talked about, uh, unless your cutoff is explicitly Lorentz violating, that has a rate which is infinity. It has something to do with the fact that the Lorentz group is a non-compact group, but that's the only way to tame those instabilities. So it's in this context of like a quantum Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's in this scenario. Yeah, yeah this, this is a consequence of this scenario. So this is a price for solely cosmological constant by this beautiful mechanism of declaring this parity, energy parity, which is by, by itself is a kind of uh, very interesting idea. Uh, but that's a, that's a price. And then there are interesting you know, phenomenological consequences, which I'm not going to uh, go to uh, that, that, that uh, talk by itself. Uh, but but I, I just want to emphasize that this one gives up on, on Lorentz invariance and, and it has very low cutoff, and, and that, that's, that's a cost. Now, another, um, another way uh, to, to look for uh, loopholes in, uh, in the theorem, in the Nogo theorem, is to is to consider backgrounds which are not constant. We, remember we said it, it was assumed that the fields which adjust uh, the, cosmo, the vacuum energy were constant. And the argument for that was that only constant fields wouldn't violate Lorentz invariance because if I had phi equals to x, well, that x, x meaning the coordinate, uh, that x violates uh, Lorentz invariance. So, uh, and that, that's why those, those backgrounds weren't considered. However, there might be more uh, intricate constructions in which fields could have coordinate dependent values and yet still retain some Lorentz invariance at low energy or some Poincare invariance. So this is a little bit notations. You shouldn't be scared of that. I, I'm talking to undergraduates. Everybody else knows this. SO3, comma 1 is the Lorentz group, and I in front, that's just a Poincare group. Again, this is just the rotations, Lorentz boosts, and translations in space and time. That's all. This is just a notation, nothing else. Okay, and we want this to be preserved fundamentally because we don't, we don't know any violation of this, in fact, in fu fu fundamental physics, experimentally and observationally. Uh, so if we, if we only had one of these groups as a symmetry group of our theory, and we postulated or found some dynamical uh, field dependent coordinates, this would be broken, and that's what we want to avoid. But if you have two, if your theory has a symmetry which is direct product of the two, then you can afford some uh, spatial dependence in the fields as long as the diagonal one remains or one of them remains, because that's all you, that's all you need. We only see one Lorentz symmetry in our world. Uh, so, but more general idea is also to have initial space-time group to have a bigger group than just four-dimensional Poincaré group, right? There, 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 there are some, some options for that. Uh, and then break it down to the four-dimensional uh, Poincaré group through those x-dependent expectation values and perhaps use that to await the no-go theorem. Uh, well, this is, this is one example. Let's say if you had, uh, so this is a metric tensor and we want metric tensor to be flat in a good approximation in today's universe if you ignore uh, ordinary density and dark energy density, and that's, that's ignorable at the scales that I'm talking about. Uh, and simultaneously, you can have uh, ordinary space-time Poincaré invariance, but you can also have internal space-time uh, Poincaré invariant parameterized by some other fields. And if those fields here, like here, acquire vacuum expectation values, which are depending on the coordinates, uh, then the product group would break down to the diagonal, just like in this example. So in the end, you would still have effectively Lorentz invariant theory at low energies, even though you've given field some uh, Poincaré invariant variant. So there is an explicit example of that. Um, this is the same equation that I already showed, Einstein's equation, but with modification here, this is a mass term. You can have that kind of theory. And uh, that mass term contains precisely those extra fields that I just spoke about. And those can have vacuum expectation values, which break the, uh, the two-group symmetry down to one. And two-group symmetry comes here precisely uh, from what I said on the last slide. There is a space, usual space-time uh, Poincaré invariance associated with this indices mu and nu here in this formulation. And then there is internal space uh, symmetry associated with these extra scalars. And that's broken to the diagonal by the vacuum expectation value. So by definition, this, this construction is 
uh, is not within the conditions of the no-go theorem because these fields now have x-dependent profiles. And it's not in contradiction with the no-go theorem. And in fact, they, can, they can cancel this. Uh, they can, they, you, you, you can have adjustment mechanism in this case. Uh, but this was something that, uh, that was, again, very dramatic in terms of uh, research in this field that even though you canceled, there are other things that you, you, you need to make sure about, and other things in this theory don't work. Uh, and therefore, it doesn't give you a realistic theory of, uh, you know, of our universe or our cosmology. And what doesn't work is that when I introduce these extra scholars, they also mediate uh, force which is competing with gravity. It's a similar force. Uh, and before I cancel the cosmological constant, uh, if I never had the cosmological constant, there is a very nice nonlinear screening mechanism how the theory saves itself from those scholars being gravity competing forces. Uh, but the moment you cancel the cosmological constant, that mechanism fades away. So it becomes weaker. So that affects that, that mechanism of screening, and therefore you are left in a theory w in which you have fifth force, which is ruled out. This, this goes back to something like Brand's Dickey, uh, you know, theories in which there, there, was a, there was a scholar which, which was in addition to gravity providing force, and it's ruled out through that. So it's a non-realistic non theory, although you know, in the conceptual it was very satisfying that you, you could cancel the cosmological constant by this adjusting it, but there is somewhere else that things work wrong. And that, that, was, that was actually very <laughs> dramatic and disappointing. So because of that, um, I should stop at uh, 4.45, 45, right? Something like that. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to give you, uh, you know, even more uh, somewhat radical example now uh, just, to, just to show you what it takes to, uh, just to follow through the argument and show you what it takes to achieve what you want to achieve, or I want to achieve, which is cancel that, that lambda. Uh, and and this, this might be a little difficult for undergraduate students because there will be a little bit more involved equations, but still, uh, it, it's, it's possible. It, should, it doesn't go beyond general relativity in some sense. So, in, in, so this was proposal by Zeitlin uh, way back, and uh, his proposal was that Ordinarily, in order to get gravitational equations, we would vary uh, the Einstein-Hilbert action. That's a variational principle that we use. He said, let's not do that. Let's vary another object, S bar, which is the Einstein-Hilbert action here, S divided by the invariant for volume. This V sub G is the integral d4x of square root of G. That's the invariant volume. So it's like volume normalized action. Right, so you've got volume here too. You integrate with respect to that volume, but he proposed to volume normalize the whole thing before you take variation. Now, at, at this level, it's clear that this makes the cosmological constant to be a unphysical parameter of the theory. The reason why is because this is a Lagrangian of everything else. This is gravity and this is everything else. And in this everything else, you can have now this cosmological constant lambda. But this lambda is multiplied by the volume. And the volume and the volume cancel out. So the cosmological constant is just an addition to S bar. It's just a constant addition to S bar, which means that it doesn't participate in variational principle. If you vary it, it's zero. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an unphysical parameter. So that was very clever construction. He had some motivation coming from string theory, not uh, very well formulated. But nevertheless, they were just motivation. And this was a very clever construction. So, so this gets rid of it. So this does what you want. Uh, does doesn't matter what, what you generate from quantum mechanics or, or any you know, vacuum expectation values or QCD or whatnot. You combine all together, and it's unphysical from the point of view of gravity. Gra gravity doesn't feel it. So that's what Pauli wanted, in fact. So that, that constant doesn't gravitate. Now, how about other stuff? Does other stuff gravitate, and what, what's the difference between you know, other stuff and, and cosmological constant. Well, it turns out this theory can answer that too. And to understand that, let's look at the equations of motion. Uh, so as I said, there will be some change, some difference in the equation of motion because of that one over volume. So if, when you do careful variation, the traceless part of the Einstein equation remains the same. This is the old good Einstein equation here. 
but the trace part gets modified on the right-hand side by new objects shown here in brackets, which are space-time averages. And those averages are defined as follows. These are integra integrals with respect to the volume divided by the volume. Okay. Now, if stuff here, instead of the dots, is a constant, then this average is non-zero. Right? Uh, and that's how this solves the cosmological constant in terms of equations. It subtracts that constant from this one. So it, it, it leaves T uh, without the cosmological constant. But if you have something which is localized either in space or time, then this integral is, e the, well, this ratio is either zero or is suppressed by the volume. So let's say if it's an infinite volume, uh, and then you have see here something localized in space or time, some, you know, some function that's localized in space and time, then this, this will be zero. And therefore, it doesn't modify gravity. It doesn't modify the, the equations of motion, right? So which tells you that, well, if I have a gravitational field of a planet here or anything, so if I calculate these averages for that planet, they're going to give me a zero contribution to the equations. So there's no modification for, for anything that's localized in space or time. And there is a modification for something that's delocalized in space and time, such as vacuum energy. So, so even if you had a scalar field which is rolling very, very slow, you would still get this feature. And the reason, it sounds really counterintuitive. It's, it's hard to believe until, until you think a little bit di uh, slightly differently and uh, what I'm about to say. The reason why that's possible is because this is highly acausal, highly acausal proposal. It violates causality and locality. The reason why is because the equations of motion that we use, these are local differential, partial differential equations that we deal with. They are defined uh, at a point. Here, the quantity at a point is defined by averages over space and time, going back into past and future. So this knows something about future. Uh, now, then you ask a practical question. For what sort of energies and momentum does it know about future? The answer is it knows about future only for the cosmological constant, because it's a constant. For anything that's decaying in time or decaying in space, it has no effect. Uh, so, well, so you see that it doesn't contradict anything. Actually, it doesn't, there is no experiment that you can do that this contradicts. However, it's highly unsettling, I want to say at least, because of this a-causal behavior. It also has uh, other issues, but th those ones can be fixed. I wanted to talk about that, except that I, I, I think in, for the sake of time, I will stop, and if there are questions, I will clarify that. So that very theory has, that very theory has other issues. With, if you start now quantizing gravity, is an effective field theory because the loop ge loops generate new terms in that Lagrangian, which actually spoil the solutions. And then there is a there is a way to solve that. Actually, there, there is a there is a, you, you can solve that uh, by by embedding this in a little bit bigger theory, and uh, then everything is in order in terms of it being you know stable with respect to the gravity quantum loops of gravity as an effective field theory, as well as everything that I said before. So you get rid of the cosmological constant, plus. You can have dark energy now, but that dark energy cannot be a small cosmological constant. It has to be something else. It can be a quintessence, or it can be some other field which has some profile in time, uh, or it can be modified gravity like massive gravity. So those things survive this, this mechanisms. But that constant, you know, vacuum energy cosmological constant does not. Uh, so this is all uh, about that. And so as I said, if, if needed, I can elaborate on that. So brief conclusions. So th this problem, to, to my view, still remains because the solutions that we have, have come with very high price. They come, one, one that I showed you comes with ex explicit violation of Lorentz and Norris very low scale, a need for completion, quantum gravity completion at that scale. Um, the other one comes with giving up on space-time locality, even though it doesn't contradict anything. Uh, still, it's somewhat strange. And then you would ask how this is better than the multiverse paradigm in which you postulate huge number of vacua and some of them being 
selected based off, based off on, on anthropic considerations. There are also some early works in very interesting direction that I didn't uh, have time to elaborate, but they also tell us something dramatic. Those are the works in which the cosmological constant would be problem would be solved before the Big Bang stage. So if you have some stage before the Big Bang, very special one, you can adjust, you can use the adjustment mechanism back then because you are less restricted by observations back then. <laughs> And then it, then it can made, 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 in, in principle can made, made work. Some, some details are still missing, but people are working at that. I find that very interesting approach. But even in that case, it would be dramatic something for our universe, which would tell you that before the Big Bang phase, there, there was some other uh, interesting physics going on. Well, in terms of observations, each of these proposals have you know, uh, some, some predictions for experimentation and observation. It just uh, I didn't have time to go through them. Uh, one in the context of uh, the non-local approach is that the dark energy cannot be cosmological constant, and that's what we always assume. But it could be something which is close to it, such as a quintessence field, for instance, that's also a very realistic candidate. It could be massive gravity, again, observationally. Uh, at the level of the background, it won't be very much distinguishable from what's being done, but at the level of fluctuations, there might be differences, and there are differences, in fact, and people are exploring this observation of consequences. But in the end, I would say, and this is to young students here, that after 50 plus years, uh, pro probably more, I don't think we have a uh, uh, happy solution for this old problem. And uh, I hope you can think about that one day, but uh, maybe when you have tenure job, you can think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, in some of the things that I mentioned uh, in, in terms of these product gr groups, it, it will be along those lines. Mm -hmm. And in the conventional four-dimensional formulation of bi-gravity, we encountered the same, same issue that there is this extra, extra helicity mode that participates, gives you, uh, gives you, you know, gravity competing force, which is hard to screen. But uh, the latest, uh, actually what I spoke about uh, in the seminar, that offers a hope, perhaps, because that's, a, that's an embedding in higher dimensional space in which tho those very issues, the screening issues, are resolved differently. That this VDVZ discontinuity is resolved through that mechanism. Maybe you don't need to rely on this nonlinear screening mechanism, in which case uh, that, that might be fine. But uh, actually, we are at that stage of exploring that, those constructions. Yeah, it's. Uh, well, I, I can tell you how I. St we, we we thought thought about non non local physics even before, but that's kind of extreme version of it. And uh, I was going to this conference in Poland, was some, some big gravity conference, and I was writing my slides, and uh, I'm saying, uh, and I was talking about dark energy, ignoring of course the cosmological constant, and I'm saying, I hate this so much that every single time I should make an excuse for this big cosmological constant. And that's a, that's a desperate measure when you really are bothered by that. And they say, let's do whatever it takes. Doesn't matter what it takes, let's whatever, something. And so that's how I, I, I went back to the cycling and then its improvement in terms of cycling's approach has this issue with, with quantum loops. But there is this generalization that I spoke about which solves that too. Uh, and, and so that's uh, probably answers your question, I hope. Solution. <laughs> uh, well, it is my local, it, yeah, for, for sure, yes. There, 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 is, there is something, I'm, I'm glad you asked, wh by which this could be ruled out. And actually, I'll be very happy if it's ruled out. So what have, because of these volume factors in front, so in, in terms of quantum uh, mechanics for gravity, what it means is that quantum loops effectively for gravity will be very much suppressed. 
or any quantum phenomena for gravity will be very much suppressed, even though if they, if they are there. So which would also mean that if there is, a, let's say, an inflationary uh, mechanism which does everything else plus produce some sizable tensor fluctuations, this is going to kill it. So if there is a way to understand all that, to establish that, okay, that's the inflationary model that gives you the you know, scalar curvature perturbations, and then it is supposed to be giving us also tensor perturbations, you don't see it. Or, or if you see it, you rule it out. And if you don't see it, then <laughs> something like that. So that's one that I know of. It's far-fetched, but uh, well, well, hopefully we will learn about the tensor fluctuations very soon within the, uh, I don't know, five-year time scale, I want to hope, by Simon's observatory. So, well, maybe even sooner. Oh, thank you. Of, of, of many different uh, scenarios. And I, I noticed that the most, the, the strongest adjective you used was unsettling. Okay. <laughs> you spoken like a true politician. No. Um, since, since you're on video here, we won't ask you maybe what are your favorite uh, scenarios, um, unless you want to comment on that. Not, 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 none of them I can call favorite, actually. None. none. That's 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 what it is. Um, yeah, I would like to pursue further. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, we need fifty new, fifty plus more years.